Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. I'm your host, Phil Black. And if you have an 8th, ninth, or 10th grader with big aspirations like the Ivy League or military service academies like West Point, ROTC, or athletic scholarships, boom, you've come to the right place. My specialty, my superpower, if you will, is preparing families for these competitive programs. I'll teach you what your child should do, when they should do it, and how you can help. So stick around and prepare to out-prepare. Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. Today, I want to review certain times in your child's high school career where making confident, well-informed, and timely decisions is critical. Now, a few caveats so that people don't freak out. These are just guidelines. These are not strict deadlines that every student must adhere to. A lot of this depends on how ambitious your child is, how mature they are, how self-aware they are, how engaged they are. And obviously, this varies widely with teenagers. My goal is to provide some high-level advice to keep in mind as your child progresses through high school so that you can gauge how close they are to making these types of decisions. It doesn't mean that if your child doesn't make this particular critical decision by this date that all is lost or that it's over or they won't get a scholarship or they won't get good letters of recommendation. It's simply there to provide a timeline for a reality check that I hope will be helpful. Now, if your child is not even close to making some of these decisions by the recommended times, that's okay too. At least you're aware and your son or daughter is aware of what a lot of other students are doing who are successful in these areas. If your child is right on time with these decisions, great. Maybe your child is well ahead of what I'm suggesting, even better. The point is, there are so many factors to keep in mind that only you and your child knows about that these are not hard and fast rules. So don't hit the panic button if your child isn't quote unquote tracking on any of these paths. And by the way, not every decision that I'll cover will be relevant for your child. Again, it depends on where they're headed, what type of student they are, how willing they are to put in the work. And maybe this goes without saying, but all of these decision points are key points of Preppel Academy's online program. In the weekly videos, I go into great depth and detail on these decisions to help you and your child decide whether or not the timelines are relevant for them. Now, for the podcast, I'm going to move relatively quickly through each one of these decision points because I want to try to cover a lot of ground. In fact, to make this a little easier to listen to, I'm going to cluster these decision points by age. So I'll do all of the freshman year decision points first, then all the sophomore year, and then the junior year. And by the way, this is hardly an exhaustive list. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of mini deadlines and decision points to consider over the course of four years. That's where PrepWell really comes in because it organizes that all for you and it feeds it to you as you need it. In this particular podcast, I've chosen the highlights. So let's start with freshman year. Number one, if your child aspires to play Division I sports in college, whether that's a full scholarship, or a partial scholarship, or maybe the Ivy League where they don't give scholarships, this decision should be made by the end of freshman year, before the summer, because the summer will be important in their progression when it comes to training, camps, invitationals, showcases, club teams, and the like. In general, Division I scholarship spots are so competitive and so few and far between, especially in headcount sports, or what we call scholarship sports, full scholarship sports, that if your child isn't ready to commit, let's call it 80% of their mental energy, their time, their bodies, and their money and resources toward their sport, then it probably will not happen. Number two, if your child wants to be considered a legitimate contender at some of the most selective colleges, and by that I mean let's call it the Ivy League schools and schools in the, say, top 10 to 20 in the the general rankings. They need to decide this by the end of freshman year. 
I give them a little bit of time to figure out high school in freshman year, but not much. If they had a small hiccup in grades, there's a chance they can make up for it. But if the pattern extends into sophomore year, it's probably going to be too late. Number three, what is your child interested in? I know this can be a tough question, and I don't mean to try to nail kids down on exactly what they want to do or be or major in or study, but I do like to encourage them to decide at a minimum whether or not they are a STEM student or a humanities student. STEM being science, technology, engineering, math, and humanities representing English, history, philosophy, sociology, those types of topics. Those are pretty broad. If you want to make it even broader, you can ask, do they like reading or math better? Or do they prefer numbers or letters more? And there will be a couple students who balk at this question. They insist that they are exactly 50-50 between the two choices, and that's okay. The majority of kids will lean one way or the other. And this is important because a decision like this could, and probably should, dictate the clubs that they join, the classes that they take, the activities they participate in over the summer, what types of jobs they might look into. They may as well begin to build their body of work that at least has some semblance of cohesion and is aligned with what they're interested in. So let me summarize freshman year. By the end of freshman year, you should decide whether or not you are Division I athlete material. You should decide whether or not you want to be a player at the most selective colleges. And you should decide whether or not you are more of a STEM student or a humanities student. Okay, let's move on to sophomore year. If your child wants to secure a significant leadership role by the end of their junior year, which is really the money year, I'm talking about president of a club, founder of a student organization, class leader. They need to make their moves early in sophomore year at the latest. This may mean that they have to join a club and spend significant time in the club for the entire year so that they can position themselves for a leadership role down the road. They will likely not get a leadership role of any significance as a sophomore, but they need to set themselves up for next year or maybe even senior year. Because what happens is kids don't think about leadership until junior year. And then when the light bulb goes off and they run for office or they try to lead a group or they run for president, they got shut down because there are plenty of students who've been in the club and been doing the work and meeting people and networking since their freshman year. And they're not going to cede control to some rando kid who shows up on day one junior year and wants to be the president. That's not going to happen. You need to lay the foundation. And for some positions, sophomore year will already be too late to position yourself for big time leadership later on. It depends on the position. It depends on the club. It depends on the culture at the school. It depends on how those leadership positions are decided on. Is it a peer election? Is it student faculty election? All those things are to be considered. Second thing, if your child has their sights set on one of the service academies, Naval Academy, West Point, Air Force Academy, Coast Guard Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, or they'd like to get an ROTC scholarship, once again, I will grant them freshman year to wing it a little bit, but after that, they need to lock in. They need to start lining up leadership positions. They need to make sure they're playing sports. They need to start taking STEM courses. And if they wait much past sophomore year, it may be too late. Number three, deciding whether to take the SAT or the ACT. Please check out my blog and several previous podcasts where I go into excruciating detail about this decision. But here are the highlights. By the end of sophomore year, your child should have taken a practice SAT and ACT within a few weeks of each other, from home, for free, and had it graded, and gotten feedback as to which one they perform better on, all before the summer after their sophomore year. Let's just go over that one more time. By the end of sophomore year, before the summer, your child should have taken 
a practice or what we call a diagnostic SAT and ACT within a few weeks of each other. So it's apples to apples. We're not talking about the PSAT. These are at home tests for free and graded, and you've received feedback as to which one you've performed better on all before the summer after their sophomore year. And I say before the summer because the summer should be devoted to actually studying for one of those two tests, not both. So they need to have decided which test to take before the summer after sophomore year. And please, don't make the decision about the SAT or ACT based on what your friend Rick said or what Sally suggested or what your teacher mentioned or which test you think you like better. Take the official diagnostics under test-taking conditions, get them graded, and make an informed decision. This is too important to leave to chance or guesswork or speculation. And if you want to know how to set up these at-home free exams, please reach out to me and I will make it happen for you. Number four, deciding what your angle will be. By angle, I mean, what type of student or person are you? What are you good at? What will you be pitching to colleges? Are you an academic? Are you an athlete? Are you a thespian, a scientist, a leader, a world traveler, a language person? These are all what I call angles. And I go through each of these and more in PrepWell's online program, of course, and with my private students. Because one of the most important parts of your college application will be whether or not an admissions officer can put you in a certain category. And how easy are you making it for them to do that? The secret is the easier, the better. And the better you are, the more you stand out in a particular category, the easier it will be for them to understand what you will bring to the college, the easier it will be for them to advocate for you because they can articulate who you are and what you stand for because you've done the work for them. You've connected those dots. If, on the other hand, you present as an amorphous blob of indistinguishable achievements, even if they're pretty good, but they're disconnected and incoherent and they don't tell a story, it's going to be difficult for you to connect with that admissions reader. And that's exactly what you want to do. You want to connect with them. You want to hit them over the head with what and who you are and pile up as much evidence as you can to prove your case. You can't wait much longer than sophomore year to begin this process. So think about what type of angle you may want to begin to build on. Number five, let's now move into the middle of sophomore year. For one, as parents, you need to know that as soon as you hit January of your child's sophomore year, this is just a few weeks ago, your financial situation becomes extremely relevant. Because in two years, when you apply for financial aid for your now sophomore, the forms, the financial aid forms, will ask you to represent your financial situation from the middle of your child's sophomore year to the middle of their junior year. Let me just repeat that. These forms are going to ask you to represent your financial situation starting at the middle of your child's sophomore year to the middle of their junior year. This catches a lot of parents off guard. They wonder why the colleges are asking you to reach so far back. That's the way it is. Now, there's some rationale behind it, and it was a long time in coming. I don't want to bog you down with those details right now. So if you get an inheritance or you have a particularly big year of commissions or bonuses during those 12 months, this could massively impact your eligibility for financial aid. And of course, the opposite is true as well. If COVID has really hurt you financially and your child is a sophomore and this financial mess lasts through all of 2021, the silver lining might be that you are now eligible for a lot of need-based financial aid. Number six, if your child is an athlete, they should start putting together a highlight film during their sophomore year that they can send to coaches. Obviously, this is assuming that they play a sport where video matters. Sophomore year is when you want to start getting on coaches' radars. They're technically not allowed to communicate with you, the coaches, that is, but they certainly can watch videos of you playing basketball or soccer or, or lacrosse or water polo. And if they like what they see, 
They may invite you to a summer camp or an invitational or a showcase. This is when you want to start building that profile. Let's move on to junior year. Number one, early in junior year, your child should identify teachers whom they will ask for college letters of recommendation at the end of junior year. The timing here is important. And if you want more details, enroll in Preple Academy, check out my blog and previous podcasts where I go deep into this topic or both. The bottom line is this. You as a student want to put on the full court press in your junior year classes that you anticipate asking for a letter of recommendation. You want to excel in the class, of course. You want to get to class early, participate, volunteer, do research projects, help the teacher, show your enthusiasm, and basically ensure that the teacher absolutely loves you right before you ask them for a letter of recommendation. Number two, another early junior year decision point is when to take the SAT or ACT. I recommend to almost all of my prep wellers, with a few exceptions, that they should take an official SAT or ACT by November of their junior year. Let me say that again. They should try, as best they can, to take an official SAT or ACT by November of their junior year. Of course, this is assuming that there isn't a worldwide pandemic preventing them from doing this. It could be in late August if they're ready. Could be in September, could be October, at the latest November, but I want an official test taken by November. Ideally, it's a one and done deal. They study over the summer, they're primed and ready, they take it one time before November and they never look back because who the heck would want SAT studying hanging over their head during junior year, the most difficult academic year? Answer no one. So get it done and out of the way early. And if for some reason, you had a bad day, you missed bubbled, you missed the test, whatever it might be, you'll still have plenty of time to recover and you will have done the bulk of your studying. Or if for some reason the world is hit with a pandemic that shuts down the entire spring testing season, you'll be happy to know that you've already taken your test, which is exactly what happened last year. And thankfully, all you diligent prep wellers out there dodged that bullet because you had your test done. And let me throw one deadline for senior year in here, of course, there are a lot of senior year deadlines, smaller, very time sensitive. The one I want to focus on is getting your college essays done before senior year begins. It's as simple as that. How many students actually do this? Very few. And the ones that do are handsomely rewarded. Because just like you don't want an SAT study hanging over your head during junior year, you do not want college essay writing hanging over your head during the first half of senior year. You do not want that. Most students have plenty of time to attack these essays over the summer, but they normally don't because they're scared, they're intimidated, or they just choose to procrastinate. Of course, with my private students and inside Preple Academy, I walk students through every step of this process during the summer, from brainstorming to outlining, to writing a first draft, seeking feedback, editing, polishing. Having these essays done before senior year is something that every student should strive for. Well, I hope that was helpful. Obviously, there are so many examples of critical decision points that have outsized impact on your child's application and prospects, but I wanted to bring up a few highlights. I urge you to listen to this podcast with your child Enroll them in Preple Academy if they're not yet enrolled and have conversations about these critical decision points. And if your child wants to blow these off, what can you do? At least you've given them the chance to understand how important they are. And that's all we can do as parents. At some point, the child needs to take this advice for action. And I can tell you from years of experience working with thousands of students in the online program and dozens and dozens of students in my private mentoring program, and this year with my own twin sons, who just went through this process, that early preparation is better than late preparation. And I have a whole laundry list of success stories to back that up. That's all I've got for you today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the support. If you know a parent with an 8th grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, 11th grader in high school, 
that you think might find this helpful, please share the episode with them. You can do that by finding that small box with the tiny arrow pointing up. That's the share button. Click that share button. Text your friends the link. Write a little personal note recommending that they give it a listen. And of course, if you have questions, comments, an idea for an upcoming episode, you want to get hooked up with those free diagnostic SAT and ACT tests, please reach out to me by email, DM me on Instagram, prepwell underscore academy. Visit our blog, Facebook, connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by PrepWell Academy. PrepWell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your ninth or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week, every Sunday, in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to PrepWellAcademy.com and enroll your child today.